had I have been on that trip to Paris, I can say without a shadow of a doubt, they would have had their seatbelts on. Princess Diana's bodyguard has chosen to come out of the shadows cast by one of history's most famous people, Princess Diana herself, to reveal the hidden secrets that lie underneath her public image. He saw the complex dance of royal life and her hardships while protecting her for years. What hidden truths has he concealed? And which discoveries will cause us to reevaluate our assumptions? We learn about Diana's enormous influence on everyone around her and the truth of life behind closed doors as we explore this riveting story. Come along with us as we uncover the facts that still hit close to home. When the car crash occurred, Galen and nine other firemen quickly made their way to the Pont de l'Alma underpass to help the victims. The front end of the wrecked Mercedes-Benz W140 was completely ruined. As the guys peeked inside, they saw that one of the residents seemed to have died. Taking stock of the luxurious saloon, Galen looked about for anybody else he might aid. There was a young blonde lady inside, and he could see that she was breathing, but very shallowly. Galen was horrified to learn that the blonde had died at the hospital since she was in a very stable condition when he was able to extract her from the automobile. While he was caring for her, he had no idea who she was. All he could think about was ensuring she survived that critical time. Even more startled was he to hear that the young lady he had rescued was Diana, Princess of Wales, when he found out about it later. Nevertheless, further details emerged. He kept quiet about what she said to him for 20 years after he assisted her out of the automobile. Growing up in an affluent family, Lady Diana Spencer was first exposed to the royal family when she was very young. Because her family resided near Sandringham House, she spent her childhood mingling with the nobility of the kingdom. But Spencer made up for his scholastic misfortune by taking many low-paying jobs in London. On the other hand, Diana was bound for a life of greater distinction. At 16 years old, she had a fascinating life change that would impact her family's financial status and her own way of life indefinitely. Even as she matured, Diana remained humble and bashful. Nonetheless, it was Charles, Prince of Wales, who found her graceful manner most appealing. Despite Charles's connection with Diana's elder sister, Sarah, the prince and princess fell head over heels for one other. An estimated 700 million people across the world tuned in to see the Prince of Wales and Diana exchange vows at St. Paul's Cathedral in 1981 during their extravagant wedding ceremony, which was broadcast live on television. Fairy tales aren't about this couple's happily ever after, unfortunately. Even though Diana was naturally reserved and unassuming, she was nonetheless expected to adhere to stringent rules and regulations as a member of the British royal family. Diana had the most wonderful idea ever when she married a prince, but the marriage was soon troubled, particularly once she learned she was pregnant. The idea that she did not deserve her new role as a princess was the primary source of Diana's inner emptiness. Photographers and reporters followed Diana wherever she went, capturing what were supposed to be personal family moments and broadcasting them online. This made Diana feel overwhelmed. Over the years, she came to terms with the fact that being in the limelight all the time would be only one of many challenges she would face. In private, the world saw Prince Charles's family as a happy, idealized bunch. However, behind closed doors, the royal couple's marriage was crumbling and chaos reigned. Accusations of infidelity between Charles and Diana surfaced as it came to light that Diana suffered from an eating problem and spells of mental instability. Although Diana had a hard time keeping up her positive public image, most agree that Charles's insensitive rekindling of his affair with Camilla Parker Bowles was the last straw that broke the marriage. The media followed them wherever they went to capture the joy of their marriage. One photo in particular brought Diana to tears. The whole story behind that terrible event has recently been revealed by Lennox, the photographer. The media incorrectly identified the photo as a reaction to the flowers that the crowd hurled at her. Despite his assertions that Diana sobbed for a few minutes, Lennox subsequently disclosed that he was told it was just heat and jet lag. This was discovered decades after the fact. 
The first red flag was when he said, I don't think Charles noticed Diana crying at that point. Prince Charles is known to turn a blind eye, so even if he did see, he would have ignored it. There were three of us in this marriage, Diana famously said in an interview with journalist Martin Bashir in 1995, referring to Charles's connection with Camilla Parker Bowles. The interview would go down in history for her candor. She was also quite open about her struggles with depression and bulimia, and she spoke about how nobody would assist her when she needed it. The interview was a watershed moment in her marriage to Charles, and the following year, they finalized their divorce. Despite the overwhelming sympathy for Diana among viewers, rumors circulated that her sons, William and Harry, were fuming at her for publicly airing their family's private problems. It brings indescribable sadness to know that the BBC's failures contributed significantly to her fear, paranoia, and isolation that I remember from those final years with her," stated William Duke of Cambridge in a statement released years after the fact. He also mentioned that Prince Harry had said that the victim's death was the result of a chain reaction caused by a culture of exploitation and unethical practices. Just over a decade after the nuptials of the century in 1992, Diana and Charles's marriage irretrievably crumbled. The divorce was finally completed in 1996. Devastated fans believed that Diana endured more pain than Prince Charles as a result of the divorce. Diana said she had few genuine friends, so she stepped away from the spotlight. A tabloid reporter claims that following Diana's split from Charles, her love life took off. The princess was said to have been beset by suitors while she was young and beautiful. Rumor has it that she had extramarital relationships while married to men like cavalryman James Hewitt and her bodyguard Paul Manneke. Last but not least, she ended her relationship with auto salesman and childhood buddy James Gilby when their leaked phone calls surfaced, in which he called her Squidgy. The media, as expected, went absolutely bonkers over the story. Hasnat Khan, a British-Pakistani cardiac surgeon, seemed to have restored the princess's life behind closed doors. Diana was trying to find a way to escape the limelight, so she kept the affair a secret. She told her pals that Khan was unlike anybody she had ever encountered. When the princess and her companion visited the Royal Brompton Hospital in London, the princess was completely captivated by the physician. Vanity Fair also said that Khan and Diana were talking about getting married as their affair developed. The princess allegedly tried to convince him to have a secret wedding, but he turned her down. Khan, who had always disliked the attention that came with being in a relationship with the world's most famous person, proposed that they go to Pakistan to escape the prying eyes of the media. It was said that Diana considered this suggestion carefully. Furthermore, it is said that the princess told her close friend Imran Khan, who is now the Prime Minister of Pakistan, about her emotions for Hasnat. The relationship started to crumble, but Khan subsequently claimed that their chats had persuaded him that she was in love with Hasnat. Even when this new information came to light, Diana continued her dogged pursuit of causes she believed in. She went to see Mother Teresa and the English National Ballet before making an appearance on the cover of Vanity Fair in 1997. Exactly that month, Egyptian businessman Mohamed Al-Fayed invited Diana to a holiday in the southern French town of Saint-Tropez, and Diana agreed. It was during a polo tournament in July 1986 when Al-Fayed first crossed paths with Diana and Prince Charles. While visiting the millionaire, Diana stayed in his villa with her two boys, Princes William and Harry. At that point, whispers started circulating that Diana had developed feelings for Dodi, the son of Al-Fayed. The media never let up on the people's princess and her family, even while they were on holiday in France. The photographers followed her wherever she went, and the front-page photos of her kissing Dodi on the Al-Fayed family boat will stay with many. Diana later told reporters at an unannounced news conference that she would shock them with her next action. Her comment turned out to be quite prophetic, but she had no idea. Rumor has it that the eldest son, Dodi Al-Fayed, 
who had a privileged upbringing and became famous as a film producer with credits on Hook, Chariots of Fire and The Scarlet Letter, had long admired the princess and had his heart set on her before his father invited her on a lavish vacation to France. Dodie and Princess Diana's bond became stronger in the weeks leading up to their untimely deaths. Upon her return to London, Diana broke off her engagement to Hasnat Khan, the Egyptian businessman she had affectionately called Mr. Wonderful. Khan confessed to the police that he did not hold a high opinion of the princess and that he believed her new romance would disappoint her. Even though Diana was devastated that her love with Khan had failed, she was determined to marry Dodi. There were several different rumors about an engagement as summer 1997 came to a conclusion. For instance, according to Vanity Fair, Dodi intended to buy a ring for the princess, even though Diana had already told her best friend Rosa Moncton that she intended to wear the ring on her right index finger and that her intention was just to provoke jealousy in Khan. However, Dodie's dad was certain that the ring was a symbol of the couple's engagement. No matter what the case may have been, Diana and Dodie clearly enjoyed themselves while they were together. They planned to go on a cruise to Sardinia around the end of July 1997. But the paparazzi were always following the pair because of their status as the most renowned people in the world. There were photos of Diana and Dodie embracing on his boat that ran in August of that year, they were both attending an anti-landmine rally in Bosnia. At the month's conclusion, the pair returned to France after their incredible vacation to Sardinia. They opted to visit Paris this time and stay at the Ritz, the hotel owned by Dodi's father. In 2019, the Daily Mirror said that as Diana remained in their room, Dodi went to a jeweler to buy the ring that the princess had been waiting for. On August 30, 1997, they dined at the exclusive Lenore later that night. They were on their way to Lenore when the paparazzi threatened to spoil their night out. Feeling uneasy about the presence of potential photographers, Dodie and Diana chose to go to their suite. They had intended to have a quiet supper for two, but the photographers made them alter their minds. Roughly 30 cameras trailed after them as they left the hotel. Diana and Dodi skipped supper and headed straight to his lavish apartment on Rue Arsène Ousset to continue their evening. Nevertheless, they were also faced with an additional critical issue. The pair had been trailed by paparazzi since they departed from the Ritz earlier that evening, and they were almost sure that cameras were poised to intervene. At last, a brilliant plan was hatched. Two imposter automobiles were to drive out of the hotel's main door to trick the photographers, while Dodie, the princess, and her bodyguard Trevor Reese Jones would make their getaway in a rented black Mercedes Benz. The events described below occurred in the wee hours of August 31, 1997. Deputy head of security at the hotel Andre Paul was implicated in the plot. Paul was summoned once again to transport Dodie, the princess, and Trevor even though it was his night off. They got into Paul's Mercedes and headed down the road just after midnight. Unfortunately, word got out to the swarm of photographers and they began aggressively trailing the limo. Paul was seated across from Reese Jones. The photographers, who Paul had prompted outside the hotel, attempted to block the vehicle later on in an effort to slow down Paul, but were unsuccessful according to the inquest. Rather, the Mercedes persisted with its trip, eventually reaching a speed of around 65 miles per hour when disaster struck. As Paul was about to approach the tunnel beneath Pont de l'Alma, the limo continued to accelerate down the road until he lost control of it. Paul would be found guilty by the inquest because he was driving with a blood alcohol concentration, BAC, more than three times the legal limit and because he was also under the influence of prescription drugs, and because there were no paparazzi around to place blame. The motorcycling paparazzi who had been after the vehicle showed up at the site, but instead of helping the wounded occupants, they only wanted to photograph the debris. Firefighters quickly dispatched from the adjacent Malar station after someone ultimately contacted emergency services. After crashing into the tunnel wall, 
The car veered to the left and with tremendous force, slammed into a roof support pillar, instantly killing Paul. On that tragic night, Galen was the deputy officer in charge of the heroic firemen that came to save the victims. Recalling details of the crash involving the world's most famous couple at the time, he revealed to the Sun what he and his team had discovered 20 years later. According to Galen, the car was in a mess, and we just dealt with it like any road accident. We got straight to work to see who needed help and who was alive. As a seasoned fireman who was familiar with the region, Galen did what was best in the aftermath of the terrible accident, assessed the situation and offered aid. Galen continued in his interview with The Sun saying, For me, this was simply a banal traffic accident, one of many that emergency services have to deal with, and it was the usual causes, speed, and a drunk driver. He went on to say, When I got to the car, I could see the driver was already dead, and there was nothing that could be done for him. The princess's horror was far from ended, even though reports indicated that Diana did not suffer any evident significant injuries in the incident. She had a heart arrest at around 1 a.m. swift cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR, provided by Galen and other first responders, seemed to be helpful at first. His interview response was as follows. I massaged her heart, and a few seconds later she started breathing again. The relief he felt was understandable given his job as a first responder, he believed he had saved lives. Galen had faith that Diana would be well once her heart started beating again, despite the seriousness of the collision. By his observation, she did not seem to be bleeding. The fireman said, I could see she had a slight injury to her right shoulder, but other than that, there was nothing significant. A small cut on Diana's right shoulder was the only visible damage, indicating that there was no blood on her. After that, Galen and his gang may have thought they had protected Diana from danger, but they were completely unaware that the worst part was still to come. As Diana was hoisted into the ambulance, hope appeared to be rising that she would reach Petius Salpetriere Hospital in time to get the finest treatment available. One thing Galen did tell the son was, to be honest, I thought she would live. Still, Terrible news would break to him in the hours after the accident and Diana's transport to the hospital, news that would shake the world. In a last-ditch effort to save Diana's life, doctors fought the clock. Before doctors could pronounce her dead, they had to try resuscitation many times. The Princess of Wales, Diana, died as a result of her injuries, which included a burst blood artery close to her heart. Her harm was little yet noticeable. It was unfortunate that Galen's night was far from ended. The death of Princess Diana was announced. Tragically, the princess died at around four o'clock in the morning. Galen, who was juggling two shifts over the weekend, recalled calling his wife to fill her in on what had transpired earlier that evening. My wife was asleep and I told her about the accident and Princess Diana. I said that she had suffered a cardiac arrest, but I'd managed to revive her the fireman who passed away recounted. Following Diana's transfer to the hospital, the world was shocked by the news of her death. The public's reaction was an outpouring of sorrow never seen before. Diana was beloved by many. After returning to France, Galen couldn't stop thinking about that tragic August night. He kept silent about it for 20 years until the fire department fired him. The courageous fireman told the son, I can still picture the whole scene. It's something I'll never forget and that I always think about at this time of year. Your continued viewing of the movie indicates that you found it entertaining. Make sure you subscribe and enable the bell icon to get alerts.